Good morning, Engage Online. We are so excited to have you here with us this morning. My name is Michelle. And my name is Alex. Again, we are so excited to have you guys join us this morning. We have a lot going on here at Engage Online, so get ready as we're going to share some opportunities with you guys. Yes. So first and foremost, we really want to connect with you. I know that we say this every single week, but it's because it's true and super important. So one of the first and easiest ways that you can do this is by filling out a connect card. Mm -hmm. And to do that, you can head to engagehallhassie.com forward slash home. And if you are a first or second time guest here with us, make sure that you let us know your shirt size and your mailing address. We would love to mail you a gift for being here with us this morning. As well, don't forget that the Zoom let out will be happening right after service. This is a super cool moment where we get to see each other's faces, talk, pray, answer any questions that you might have, and just get to know each other a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, to find the link for this, you could go to engagehallhassie.com forward slash home right after service. And just a quick sidebar about the Zoom let out. Y'all, if you haven't been there yet, you're missing out. Right. Last week, we had <laughs> such an incredible conversation following the sermon. So yeah. make sure that you check it out today after service. Um, a few quick things. This is going to be a lot of information. I'm going to remind you of the highlights after service. But a few other ways that you can get connected here. One, join a serve team. We are currently recruiting for yes, our Engage Online team. <laughs> so we would love if you signed up and served with us on Sundays. Two, if you're new to your walk with Jesus or just new to engage, we would love for you to get signed up for Catalyst. It's just going to be a deeper dive into spiritual foundations. Three, we've got our assist intensive coming up soon. It's going to be going side by side with the sermon series that we're in right now. And then last but not least, we've got the Nehemiah Institute that is starting June 1st. Alex just graduated from this. It is a really incredible time, a really good next step in your walk with God. So we'll recap all of that at the end of service. But if you want to know more, you can head to engagedshalhasi.com forward slash home. For now, we are going to get ready to enter into worship. Mm -hmm. Grab your family, your friends, your neighbors. <laughs> I'm going to pray for us before we start. God, thank you so much for who you are and for what you're doing here at Engage Online. Um, God, I pray that you would just remind us that you are present in any moment, wherever we find ourselves, God. I pray mm -hmm. that you um, would be with us, that you would leave, lead us, God, and that we would follow you wholeheartedly, yes, God. God. Um, prepare our hearts as we enter into worship this morning. In your name I pray, amen. Amen.
born to redemption by the grace in his eyes. If his grace is an ocean, we're all sinking. Oh, and heaven needs earth like an unforeseen kiss, and my heart turns by the inside of my chest. I don't have time to maintain these regrets. I want to welcome you back here to Engage Online. My name is Adrian. I serve as the lead pastor here. We are continuing in our series called Seasons, Leaving Disillusionment and Embracing Fulfillment. Leaving Disillusionment and Embracing Fulfillment. As I mentioned last week, I believe that this sermon series will be something I can always point people back to. It'll be one that'll be incredibly significant in the history of our church because I believe that no matter where we find ourselves, no matter what time we find ourselves, this is a sermon series that'll be timeless. It's a sermon series where we really hope to actually help you gain wisdom, to gain insight and perspective, applied skill. See, many of us actually struggle with the start of seasons. We learned last week that seasons is a part of a rhythm, that in the DNA of the world, seasons was made. God made the world to have seasons. 
What we tend to do is actually think God works in years. We think that, hey, 2020 is over, man, we're going to 2021. This year is over, we're going into a new part of our lives. But actually, seasons aren't just based on a yearly calendar. Sometimes seasons can be very short. Sometimes they can be very long. But the key is us actually understanding what season we're in, enemies of seasons, why we have seasons. And so we're going to be unpacking that over the next several weeks, this concept of seasons. And today, what I'm going to jump into is actually what I believe is one of the biggest enemies of this idea of season. See, I believe that whenever there's something that's going on, there's always a, an opposition, something that's coming against it. And what today we're going to do is actually dive into what I believe is one of the biggest enemies of embracing the seasons that we're in. So before we get started, I'm going to pray for us. We're going to dive in and we're going to get to work. So Father, we thank you so much for who you are. God, we are asking right now, for you to come and for you to visit us, God. Lord, we're crying out for wisdom. Your word tells us that wisdom cries aloud in the street, so God, we're asking for wisdom. God, help us not only to get information that's in our head, but help that information go to our hearts. Father, I'm praying as a church body and a movement, God, that you would allow us to recognize and understand the seasons that we're in. For those who are watching today, That, Father, some are in a season of their lives where they're planning. Some are in a season of their lives, Lord God, where they're producing. Some are in a tough season of, God, of really pruning. But no matter where we find ourselves, God, I pray that we would understand that, God, no matter what season we're in, you're with us, God. That you're guiding us and leading us. God, open up our hearts, our souls, our minds to hear from you. We love you and we honor you. We say, come Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. The title of my sermon is this. It's called What's Next? What's Next? One of my favorite TV shows, maybe my favorite TV show of all time, is called The West Wing. The West Wing is a show written by one of my favorite writers, a guy by the name of Aaron Sorkin. And West Wing is a depiction of really the West Wing of the White House. It stars Martin Sheen, who serves as the president. His name is Josiah Bartlett. Again, if Josiah Bartlett actually was running for office today, I would never hold a sign for a president. I would hold it for Josiah Bartlett, all right? And so Josiah Bartlett was the president. I mean, you had Rob Lowe was there. You had Dulé Hill was a part. And again, this is one of the most decorated shows in the history of TV. I mean, again, well-written, funny, serious, in-depth look. And so again, it's a show that I to watch. I've seen this literally all seasons at least five times. That's how much I literally love the show The West Wing. Well, the idea of what's next, President Bartlett had this statement. He had an assistant, a longtime assistant uh, by the name of Miss Landingham. And what he would say to Miss Landingham was this, when he was ready to move on to the next thing, he would say, what's next? See, when the president would say that, and he said it throughout many episodes through many years, when he would say what's next, he was ready to move on. That whatever information he needed, whatever meeting he was in was done, he would just yell out, Miss Landingham, what's next? And see, I think about that, and that's one of my favorite quotes that he would say. Matter of fact, I find myself saying that many times when a meeting's over with, I'm ready to move on. I literally find myself saying that, what's next? See, this idea of what's next, what's ahead of us? See, we all think about what's next. See, human beings were made for progression. Human beings are always thinking about what's next. I mean, think about it. If you are a parent, we're always are thinking about what's next. We're thinking about the fact that when we we're, we're what's next, we're expecting a baby and we're super excited about that baby, you know, getting here and being here. And then all of a sudden you get the baby and then what happens next? You're saying, oh, I cannot wait for the baby to be able to interact. Then you're saying, I can't wait for the baby to sit up. Then, oh, what's next? I can't wait for the baby to start crawling. Oh, then I can't wait for the baby to start walking. And then you actually wake up to reality as a parent of like, that was a dumb idea to embrace the season you were in because now they're into everything, right? And you're covering everything, putting safety precautions, making sure little Johnny or Susie doesn't, you know, eat a Tide Pod or something like that, right? And so you're like, man, you wish those old days, they would just sit there and just stare at baby Einstein or whatever the new wave is for babies, right? But we're always thinking what's next. My baby, my daughter, Brooklyn, is entering into high school next year. That's a wild thing for me. Well, we have been going through classes and, 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 and seminars about the school she's going to next year. And, and here's what's interesting. Entering high school, they're already talking to us about how we need to start preparing her now for college. I'm like, I'm just now getting to the reality that my little girl 
who I used to sit there and sing to, who used to dance around with her pigtails and all things, is going into high school, right? And they're telling me, I've got to start thinking about what, like college? I'm not even thinking about college. I'm trying to figure out a way to put her in a tower like Rapunzel and she could never leave and just be there, right? Because I'm just a dad and I want to protect her. But like they're telling me it's always what's next. I mean, think about it. I mean, even in organizations and companies, the market, all companies will talk about is what are they providing for their shareholders? You're only as good as your last quarter. Think about you and your job right now. You get the job, you're excited about the job, and what do we do? Man, what's next? What's the next promotion? Think about your relationships. You have a set of friends, and then you're always thinking about, man, what's next? What about these group of friends? What about this social setting I can be in? You think about maybe that in your marriage. You think about that in the house that you live in or maybe the apartment that you're living in. You are saying, man, what's next? See, we live in this culture and we have inside of us is what's next. See, the truth be told is that human beings, there is something written within the DNA of us that actually care about what's next, that we want to progress. Humanity was made to progress. And actually, this is a part of who we are. So if you go back to the beginning of the story of God, God told humans to go and to make something of the world. Human beings were never called to just stay stagnant. They were always called to go to actually carry the presence of God, to, to explain his goodness, to make, to create, to build tech, to go, and to go to farming, human flourishing, building, architecture, art, whatever it is. Human beings were always called to push things forward. We were always called to move towards what's next. And so those desires for us to think ahead and to think about the future and to think about our family and to think about what this is going to look like in retirement and on and on, we were hardwired to be thinking about those things. But if you've been around here, you've heard enough of that the world turned, the world got crazy in Genesis 3, is that in Genesis 3, sin entered the world. See, human beings cared about the flourishing and the advancement and the progression, but it was always about human flourishing. It was always about empowerment. What are people doing in order to make the world a better place? That was the job of our first parents. But Genesis 3 happened and our parents, first parents, Adam and Eve, sinned against God. And since they sinned against God, now sin entered the world. And now here's what happened. People, human beings still look to what's next, but our motivation changed. See, in the beginning, they were called to take the peace, the shalom of God to the world. That's how things ought to work. But Genesis 3 happens, and you've heard me say it before, that the shalom was cracked. It was like putting a knife through the fabric of this incredible tapestry. That's what happened when sin entered the world. And now human beings still were thinking about what's next, but now the motivation was fear, anxiety, envy, jealousy. These were the things that now begin to motivate humans to go to what's next. And that same disease of sin and the same effects of sin has impacted us. It's impacting our nation. It's impacting our world right now. With the rise of technology, more than ever, we're constantly thinking about what's next. But our idea of what's next many times is not about the human flourishing. Now, parts of us is, yes, we do want to see humanity get better and serve people and help people and all those things. But deep within the core of humans, many times right now, why we're trying to get that bigger home, why? is because we're trying to keep up with somebody else. We're happy with the home we have, but we're like, no, no, I've got to get this. Why? Because it's a status symbol. And there's nothing wrong with moving into a big home and having those things. I'm not saying that. But what I want us to, to dive into is wondering, man, why do we do that? Why is it right now as parents, again, my daughter's going, is in eighth grade going tonight, but man, we start to freak out about what college is she going to go to? What college is she going to get into? What is she going to do? Is she going to, is she going to go to college? Is she going to be an entrepreneur? What is she going to do? We start thinking about stuff way ahead. Why? It's because our anxiety begins to drive us. I mean, think about it right now. I mean, think about this, this, this whole theme in our culture of passive income, right? I was watching a video and, and this thing about passive income, everybody talks about passive income. Man, I just want to go lay on a beach in Aruba or whatever and just have money coming in and not really work. Well, like, that's dumb, right? Like, here's the reason why, because you're going to have to work, okay? But here's why there are so many scammers out there selling people these things. Why? It's because we have this overwhelming fear of our future, and we want to make this type of money, do this type of job. And there's nothing wrong with trying to have passive income or do something different, but we're constantly putting money into why? Because whatever we see out there, whatever's in the future, whatever we have fear for, it is pushing us. Whatever, whoever we're trying to keep up with will cause us to fall into scams and have a lack of wisdom. And actually, what we're investing in. See, the truth is that when we're constantly thinking about what's next, 
See, this is the biggest enemy, in my opinion, of seasons. Because see, though, yes, we should think about the future, we constantly live out there. And when we live out there, we actually cannot embrace the one that we're in. We can't actually grow, learn. We can't actually figure out, gain wisdom, gain insight, actually enjoy the seasons that we're in because we're constantly pushing. And what tends to push us are things that are not healthy. They're not things that actually God has called us to, to motivate us. And it leaves humanity tired. Like, as I'm saying this, I know this for many of you watching, you're exhausted. I mean, you're exhausted because why? I mean, you're, you're, you're thinking about, man, over the next few months, you got travel season coming, maybe in a sport. And you're thinking, man, I've got to go from this event and this tournament and this event and this thing for your child. You're thinking about, man, you may be going back to start working in an office. You may begin to think about, man, the family vacation we have to have or, or the lack thereof. And what does that look like? And you're seeing other people go on vacation. You're not going on one. So now all of a sudden, what do you want to do? You begin to like, worry and anxiety is creeping in that you're missing out or that you're not providing or you're not a good husband or a good wife or, or a good parent because you're not providing your kids with those opportunities. And so worry begins to creep in because you're thinking about what's next. I got to get to this money. I got to get to this place. Some of you right now, you're not embracing the season that you're in and you're seeing others. Maybe, you know, again, summer's coming, people are getting married and all those things. And so now all of a sudden now the anxiety is picking up inside of you of I don't have this and I don't do this. And what we do, we worry and we're tired and we weary and depression sets in. Maybe you're not in the place of life you thought you would be. Maybe you thought at this point in your life, you'll be farther along. Let me just put a little bit of insight into that. No one really is ever where they think they should be. We always think we should be better than where we're at. So just the one to pin that for you. But here's the truth about it. But we get exhausted. We get tired. And all of a sudden, when that happens, we begin to cope with other things. We cope with food. We, we cope with drugs. We begin to cope. Um, again, even in good stuff, working out, we begin to cope with the idea of, um, of separating. We begin to, to cope with Netflix. We begin to cope with, with sex. We begin to cope with whatever. Why? Because we're exhausted and we're tired because what happens? Society, the world, our own flesh is constantly pulling us to what's next. And I know you're tired and you're probably wondering, okay, you, you understand this. You maybe would be agreeing with what I'm saying to you right now, but you're also probably asking, okay, so what do we do? How do we actually live in the season? I get it. Guys, you have to understand, I am a futurist at heart. I always think about the future. It's so hard for me to live in the present. I am always thinking about what is coming. And some of that is very helpful. Some of that has made the impact that's made in this church. It's made the impact that's made in the businesses that I run. It's made impact societally because I'm always thinking about what's next, what can happen, reading the signs, looking what's going on, studying the market, studying different. I love looking at the future, but let me tell you this as well. It's one of the biggest reasons why I'm dissatisfied many times in life, many times where depression kicks in in my own soul is because of this idea of what's next. And so as I'm preaching to you today, I'm preaching to myself. As I was studying this week, I was studying for myself. So at the end of this sermon, I'm probably going to do an altar call and I'm going to respond. Bond, okay, so we'll just hope somebody else will lead us in this moment, all right? But what I want to do is actually take us to the ancient text. I'm going to take us to scripture because I believe Jesus actually helps us with this. We're going to read a, a scripture that's pretty popular, pretty famous, but we're going to have a little different look and spin on it today. If you have a Bible, turn with me to Matthew chapter 11. I'm going to read a couple verses to you really quick. If not, it's going to probably pop up right around me somewhere, all right? They're going to do this. And again, the, the magic of my man Frierson who works in post-production, all right, with what he does makes me look good. All right, so here we go. Matthew 11, it simply says this. Then Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart. You will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. This passage, this is kind of the, this is the pre-show to what's going to happen in Matthew 12. See, in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus begins to address 
the Pharisees because the Pharisees had this beef and they began to kind of now like subtweet. They began to now become, have, you know, kind of come with some really big energy toward Jesus' disciples because Jesus' disciples and 12 are walking in a grain field and they're picking grain and eating it. And there was a thing that was added to the law that you weren't allowed to do that on the Sabbath, right? And so Jesus is addressing idea of the he's going to address the idea of the sabbath but he gives him kind of this pre-show here in matthew chapter 11 see jesus says this thing that's really profound actually we read it and when you read it and i know when i read it i'm like man that sounds great right you know those words those things you read in scripture from jesus that like they seem like this utopian world you're like man jesus are you just disconnected from reality chief because like i mean like Everybody reads like, yo, I want rest for my soul, right? I mean, who doesn't want rest? That sounds good. That sounds so like, I mean, like this incredible philosopher. And again, that's what made Jesus incredible because he was like this, he was this unbelievable rabbi, but yet and still he was way, he was like this way better Aristotle with how poetic he was and the things he would say. That just sounds right. I'm gonna come give you rest for your souls. And we all hear that. And it's like, man, it is like water, man, in a really hot day. It is something that just brings great like satisfaction when you read something like that. But it seems like it's something that's so unattainable. I read that it seems so unattainable. You're gonna give me rest for my soul. Do you not know who I am? Do you not know how you made me? Like, do you realize, God, how I got made? Do you realize how broken I am? Rest for my soul. That seems like a passage that's like, yeah, Jesus was disconnected, right? That Jesus was out there just in the middle of a field with his homeboys, just kind of philosophically talking about, you know, the, the future of the world, right? And just kind of stuff that doesn't, not grounded in reality. But actually, it is grounded in reality. See, I believe that if we can unpack this, I believe it's going to help us. And I believe not only going to help you, not going to help me, but it's going to actually hopefully give us a chance if we can begin to do this is help others. Because remember, the insight that God wants to give us and the insight that God wants to give you, it's, it's about you, but it's not about you. He wants to give us insight. He wants to give us wisdom so we can begin to live in a certain way. So then that wisdom will exude from us in order to help others do that. And see, this is important as we're learning because so many times when we come to church and what churches sometimes can do and pastors can sometimes do is preach all about you and not realizing that everything about the gospel has everything to do with you and nothing to do with you. It's about the glory of God. But what we have to do is internalize it, hit for us first, and then from there, allow it to go forth. There's three movements I believe that if we actually can do, we can embrace, if we can actually begin to implement this, make this part of the rhythm of our lives as individuals, as us as a church, I believe right here, we can see some real impact. See, the first movement is this, is a movement towards him, really a movement towards him. Jesus says, come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy burden. See, this idea where there's this invitation that Jesus says, come to me. He doesn't say, I'm going to force you to. He gives this invitation. As a gentleman, Jesus reaches out and says, come to me, all of you who are weary. Now, when Jesus is talking, because as he's doing, he is, he is talking to actually big crowds. And these crowds were incredibly diverse. There were those who were of Jewish descent. There were the, his disciples that were there. There were Pharisees that were there. There were those who were there were not part of the, of the Jewish race. So there's all these different types of people. And so Jesus reaches out. He says, come to me, all of you who are weary. Jesus knew when he's saying that, he's not just saying, hey, I know there's a few of you who are weary. No, no, no. He knows everybody out there is weary in soul, right? And I know right now you're like, that's not me. Yes, it is. Every human being, we are weary and heavy burden, right? When you think about that idea, all of you who are heavy burden, things that weigh us down. I mean, things that, that sit upon us, right? I mean, we're heavy burden with financial debt, right? You think about that. We have heavy financial debt because of why? Of what's next? Trying to keep up with the Jones. So we have that, man. We have very heavy emotional things that we're carrying, a heavy burden, man, of things in our past that we maybe haven't dealt with. I mean, trauma and pain that's happened, that's happened recently. We all have the heavy burdens we carry. We have the heavy burdens that we carry of what we're seeing in our nation society, even as I record this today. Again, another killing of another unarmed black man in our country. And I'm just saying this to black man, that's a heavy burden I carry. The heavy burden of the fact of the state of what is gonna happen in the future of our country. The heavy burden of the fact of the level of debt our children are gonna be left with. The heavy burden of our, our retirement. 
If you're a college student, the heavy burden of what's going to happen right now if you're about to graduate and where's my next job going to be entering to a market? We don't know what's going on. See, there's a lot of heavy burdens and those heavy burdens make us weary. They make us tired. And Jesus has this invitation to all those people around saying, come to me, all of you who are who are heavy burdened. And this is a powerful statement. It's because again, just like how it is in our society, many times people just stick with people who are like them. The invitation comes to those they like, those they're around, the, their friends, the people have similar interests. But Jesus in that moment says, no, no, all of you, All of you who are heavy burdened, I want you to come to me. And he says, there's this yoke upon you. See, this idea of this yoke being upon you, we're going to get to the idea of the yoke in a second. But see, Jesus, as he's doing this, the crowd, especially those of Jewish descent, would have understood this idea of all those who are heavy burdened and carry a yoke. See, you see throughout the Old Testament, many times this idea of a yoke, a heavy burden that was carried, referred to this idea of religion, we're going to get to a second, but also the hand of the oppressor. I mean, even if you read it in Lamentations 5, it says this, speaking of the Egyptians and the Assyrians, it says, those who pursue us are at our heels. We are exhausted, but are given no rest. Those who pursue us are at our heels. We are exhausted, but are given no rest. Literally, one translation says, the yoke that's upon us. The yoke that's upon us. And see, Jesus in this moment, He's appealing to all crowds. He's appealing to the Jewish crowd, but also to the Greeks as well. Because Greek philosophers, there was this, this idea of a, a really an adoration or respect for leaders who showed meekness and gentleness. Jesus talks about that later. I'll talk about his nature, who he is. He's, he's humble. There's a gentleness to him. And in that moment, he's saying, no, 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 I need you to move towards me. See, what we can tend to understand when we think about what's next The pressures and the worries of this world, the worries of life and society, the fear of what's happening, our anxiety, our shame, our envy of someone else and what they have, begin to drive us toward more stuff. And here's what it drives us to. It drives us to more chaos. See, when Jesus says, I come to give you rest, what is he speaking of? He's speaking of what was happening in Genesis 1. I've come to give you shalom. I've come to give you peace. And see, human beings in our soul, we're so restless because, and what do we do? We do this stuff. We're trying to find what's next because why? We're trying to find peace. We want the shalom, the way the world should work. We're trying to think that this house and this friend and this significant other and this money and this job and the right person in office or whatever it may be, is going to give us the type of peace that we need. The right therapist is going to give us the right peace that we need. The right medication is give us the right peace that we need. All of a sudden, my kid's behavior is going to give me the peace that I need. My friend just got me. It's going to give me the peace that I need. If I have this many followers on IG, it's going to give me the peace that I need. If I look a certain way, my body's a certain way, it's going to give me the peace that I need. And here's what Jesus is saying. You're all heavy burden and you're all trying to do this because you're all trying to find your way back to Eden, to the original intent of man where we lived in a shalom of God. But what he's saying to them, the way you're living, the things that you're doing, the worries of this world, what is pushing us, it's leading to chaos and more destruction. But yet and still, it is tricking you to think it's going to give you rest. Think about this. We all think, man, I just cannot wait to get to vacation. Man, I cannot wait to have a certain amount of money. In the words of the late great prophet, notorious B.I.G., more money, more problems. And I can tell you that is a true statement right there. See, because we think the things of this world is going to float us to the utopian world we want, and it's going to give us rest. But if you stop and critically thought about it, it's just created more chaos. And not because of money, not because accolades, not because promotions, not because of main advancement of our children, not because of homes or whatever it may be, not because of, uh, of your 401k being intact, uh, not because, man, you got the right education. Those things are bad. But what happens is that those things have, they become misplaced. They become things that become the center of our world that we think are going to give us the shalom of God instead of realizing there's only one who can actually give you peace. Why? Because Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And so because he's the Prince of Peace, the Prince of peace has to export what he has inside of us we cannot we have we don't have it in us and so that's why he says come to me because i'm going to give you peace many of you are so tormented right now because you're looking for other things to give you rest to your souls and it never will i want to encourage us to stop and to think And the thing that you place, we all have it. We all have this magical place that we get here. It's going to bring rest to my souls. 
And if we really thought and we really sit back and we really dial in, we all would say this part. We know it's not. But that's why we have to move towards him. Because Jesus says, come to me and I'll give you rest. See, the next thing we have to do is we have to move. We have to have movement. We have to move with him. We have to move towards him. Now we have to move with him. See, Jesus begins talking about this thing about a yoke. Now, again, you guys know me. I'm not the outdoor type of brother, all right? So, again, I actually have to study this type of stuff, talk about yokes and, you know, again, all that stuff. I don't do animals. Again, I got a dog. It's about as far as I'm going to go, all right? But, man, this idea of a yoke. Now, a yoke, was, again, was this instrument that was used for really treading up a field, for, for digging up a field when you're going to plant it. And what they would do, they would take this, again, like kind of this wooden instrument, and they would place it on the neck of two normally oxen, right? But what they they would do is they would partner an ox and one that was more mature with the one a little bit younger, the one a little bit stronger. And what they would do together is these ox would go and they would go in straight lines plowing the field. And what they would do is that the stronger ox was the one leading. It was the one leading them. And so when Jesus says that yoke, now he's not saying, hey, all right, I need y'all to go out there and get an instrument and put a, and put a, a yoke that we put on ox on your neck. If you go do that, fam, you're going to have rest. No, it's not going to be, that's going to actually make me feel dumb. It's going to make me feel overburdened. Again, having something on your shoulders all day, summer of Tallahassee, you know how awful that sounds, right? Doing that. This is not what he's saying. See, Jesus knew and they knew, the crowds knew, many times the idea of a yoke would refer to the law. The yoke would refer to the law. The yokes with time would refer to human oppression. See, that's why we just read in Lamentations, it talks about this yoke that was upon us, the yoke of the oppression, but also the yoke of the law. And see, Jesus comes to him and he says this, you come to me and he says, take this up. He says, when you begin to move with him, I want you to take something up. See, he's saying to them, listen, you guys have been living under this law. Remember, he's getting ready to address the Pharisees about the Sabbath and how they began to think the law was going to liberate them. And so the law was just there to point out to them how broken they were in the need of a savior. And so what he says to them in this moment is saying, no, 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 that law, which you think is going to save you, that religion you think is going to save you, that money you think is going to save you, that job you think is going to save you, that ideology you think is going to save you. Those things that you think are going to bring you liberation, they are heavy yokes upon you. And here's what you have to do. You have to take that off and you have to put my yoke on. He's saying to them, put down the yoke of religion, put down the yoke of worldly desires and put on the yoke of the kingdom. See, God tells them they have to begin to move with him. And see, just as that stronger oxen would lead the younger one in a direction they go, God wants us to move with him. But to move with him, we have to put on the yoke of the kingdom. What does that mean? That means coming to a place of a relationship with Jesus. If you are watching this and you're not a follower of Jesus, here's what that simply means. That you yourself cannot gain your way to God. No matter what your desire in your heart is, no matter what you've been taught, that you think by showing up to church, watching online, giving money, doing some good deeds, and reading your Bible, all those things are good, but those things don't save you. Scripture teaches us that it's simply by what Jesus did, his behavior. And the most important two behaviors of things that happen is Jesus' death on the cross in our place for our sins, but also his bodily resurrection, that he had no sin, so death could not hold them. Death was a result of sin. And because death was a result of sin and he had no sin, literally death had no chains on him that could not hold him, and he resurrected. And it said belief in that is what saves us. That is now putting on the yoke of the kingdom. Now, here's the deal. As we put that yoke on, that's, not, that's a one-time thing where God comes to us, we put the yoke on. Now, here's the deal. But we have to move with him. Many times people, unfortunately, have been taught you get saved and you're saved. And yes, it is not that we can keep it in our own behavior that keeps our salvation or anything like that. But ultimately what happens though is that when we get the kingdom, you still have to move with the king. You get the kingdom, you have to still move with the king. And Jesus is saying, will you take this yoke upon you and move with me? Because let me tell you this, whether if you think so or not, there's something else that's guiding you right now. See, we actually, the deception of our world and this idea of what's next and getting us out of our season is that we actually think that we are the ones moving ourselves when we're not. It is demonic. It is our flesh. 
It is pressure, it is envy, it's all the stuff that moves us many times. And that moving with that yoke takes us away. It causes us to go toward chaos. It causes us to go to more toward deconstruction of society, more toward deconstruction of culture, instead of moving forward with him. See, when you talk about putting on this kingdom, Jesus teaches all through Matthew, especially the first part of Matthew, I mean, about what it means. And, and one of the verses I'm going to read to you is found in Matthew 6, 34, right after my favorite verse, which is uh, Matthew 6, 33. But here's what it says. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. See, Jesus in that moment is saying, listen, your anxiety ain't going to make tomorrow better. Your anxiety, your envy, of watching the Kardashians and wanting to have whatever, your hate that's in your heart toward other people, your lack of trust, whatever it is, it's that and it pushes anxiety, it's not gonna free you. Matter of fact, it's taking you away. See, Jesus, when he says this prayer and he's teaching them, he said, listen, when you put the kingdom on, you can sell and rest because all prior to it, he's speaking to them of how you get rid of greed and how greed can take you away because he's saying you have to trust me he's like i clothe the lilies of the field look how i take care of the birds he's like how much more do i care for you and he says no no no. but when you are walking with him when you're moving with him what it does it gives us a peace the shalom that knowing god's going to provide he is Jireh. he is our provider think about that how many times in your life and in my life do we make decisions out of the fear of, of, of not having, we get ahead of our season, or we're so fearful that God's moving us in a new season where we may have to leave a job that's paying us a little bit more, but we're actually gonna begin to walk in what God calls us to. He may be moving you to a new city to be a part of a new movement or something God's doing, but we're like, whoa, 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 this is gonna impact me financially. And because why? Because ultimately we think that we are the ones who provide, but don't forget the word says that the earth is the Lord and all that's in it. God is the one who provides for us. And again, that's not, you don't use wisdom, you use your brain. But let me tell you many times that God will actually move you to a place that makes no sense. But he says, when you walk with him, there's a peace, there's a trust. It's a reminder of Psalm 23, that no matter where you walk through, he comforts you, he walks with you. See, I love how John Mark Comer says it this way about our world and our life right now. Ultimately, nothing in this life, apart from God, can satisfy our desires. Tragically, we continue to chase after our desires and infinite them. The result, a chronic state of restlessness, or worse, angst, anger, anxiety, disillusionment, depression, all of which leads to a life of hurry, a life of business, overload, shopping, materialism, careerism, a life of more, which in turn makes us even more restless. And the cycle spirals out of control. Here's my point. The solution, an overbusy life, is not more time, it's to slow down and to simplify our lives around what really matters. As John Mark Oldham is getting to, he's saying, listen, as we continue to follow the yoke of religion, the yoke of worldly desires, the yoke of worldly oppressions, those things, it just continues to speed us up. And he says simply this, what Jesus is writing, he says, no, 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 it's making it simple. It's Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom. What matters the most? Because when you make what matters the most in the front, when you begin to put the yoke of the kingdom, there's a peace that's there. The final thing that we have to do is that we have to move for him. We have to move for him. Jesus says, come to me and I'm going to teach you. I'm going to teach you. See, what I've come to realize is that in our everyday life and in my everyday life is that the fact that I so forget that actually God wants me to go do things he's called me to, but as he calls me to go do it, he's actually there with me. Jesus says that when you put my yoke on, right, when you put the yoke of the kingdom, I'm going to actually teach you how you should live. I'm going to teach you what decisions you should make. I'm going to teach you how you should respond. I'm going to teach you how you should love. I'm going to teach you how to forgive. I'm going to give you insight into that problem that people at your job have been trying to figure out. I'm going to teach you. I'm going to teach you to trust me, even though you're not seeing what you hope to see within your kids or maybe in your marriage. I'm going to teach you to trust me that I've got your future under control. I'm going to teach you to understand I'm 
the God who created the heavens and the earth and I am for you. I'm going to teach you about justice. I'm going to teach you about holiness. That if you go, I'm going to teach you. And this idea that we have to move for him. See, Jesus wants to teach us because as he's teaching us, he wants us to go in a direction that's going to bring his kingdom. See, most of the times, the what's next, the enemy of the seasons, what gets us out of seasons is not because it's what God wants for us. It's what we want. And if you are going to walk and if we're going to actually live in a way to embrace our seasons, to put the yoke of the kingdom on, we have to realize that we are moving for him, that our life is not our own, that we are now, we are now slaves to righteousness, that we are now, that man, we are now followers of him. We are a royal priesthood. All these things he gives us, we are innovative reconcilers. And what we're called to do is now go into the world and to do his bidding, is to, is to share his good news. It's to add value into all the spaces God will call us to go. It's for us collectively as a church to live as a diverse body and living not only with diversity and inclusion, but with equity and empowerment of people. We're called to go and give power away. He's called us to go and to do and to build and to make, but it's about him. And let me tell you this, over the years of me serving Jesus, when I find myself with high anxiety and depression and where I want to quit and when I want to end, it's because of the fact I want to be somewhere that I want to be, not where God's calling me to go. But let me tell you, when I have settled in and when I've trusted him and when he's walked and I've walked with him and I don't get ahead of him and I don't try to pull to the side of him, because let me tell you this about God. God will let you, if you keep fighting him, he'll let you drift and he'll let you get in your chaos. And when he's so loving, he'll pull you back in, but you'll start right where you just left off. But that's another story. But here's the deal. But as we go, and as I walk with him, here's the amazing thing about God. He actually will speak to you. Some of you need to hear this today, that as you are going right now in your everyday life to just stop and to ask him when that time and those things of your past pop up, that shame creeps up, that, that anger creeps up, where you got that frustration and anger and bitterness that's creeping up from a, from a pain of a parent or a pain of a, of a, of a past significant other other, or you have the pain of being misunderstood, or you're struggling right now with the reality of maybe you're a person of color and seeing injustice in the world, and it's a struggle to you, for you. Let me tell you this, that Jesus, as we move for him, he's walking right with us. You can talk to him. You can ask him. He cares about our, our everyday lives. He wants us to live and to behave and get wisdom, not so that we can have our best life now, so that we can be a reflection of his kingdom, that it's attraction, that people can see our lives and they can say, man, I don't, I, I struggle with this, but there's something about a peace that you have. I know you're going through hell right now, but you have a peace in the midst of hell. That in the midst of a, the valley um, that you're in, you have a peace. At the mountaintop, there's a humility that's there. There's a meekness that's there. That when they see us as a collective body, people can say, how do you guys do that? How is it that you have people who are good old boys from the South who like to hunt and fish? You have city kids. You have people from different nations who all come together and in the name of this kingdom, this God, you walk together and there's room there. The only way we make it as a body together to be what God's called us to be as a movement, to go to these different spaces and to create this new way that God's called us to build. It is by every single person that he's online, our midtown location, living in a way where we're connected to God, we're moving forward together, yoked with him, being about his business. As we do that, he gives us wisdom, he gives us us more of his Holy Spirit that creates more forgiveness, gives more room for others. Family, we've got to begin to move for him. But as we move for him, he's right there with you. If we're going to understand and embrace seasons, we have to live in the one that we're in. And the way that you do that is putting the yoke of the kingdom on. If you want to know what that means, I would encourage you to go and read, starting in Matthew 5, Jesus teaches his ethics of the kingdom of how we should live and how we should be and how we should move. And see, as I close today, here's what I want to invite you to. This is what Jesus invited us all to. Come to me. Some of you right now, you're not a follower of Jesus watching this. And Jesus is saying, come to me. I know you've messed up. I know you got stuff. He's saying, come to me. There's some of you right now that he's saying, hey, 
I need for you right now to move. I need you to move with me. You've now tried to take off the kingdom yoke and you're putting on a new yoke. For others, God's inviting you to begin to invite, he wants you to invite him to your everyday life as you're moving for him. Maybe you've been sensing God redirecting some things in your life. We could be in any different place. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray for us, and I'm going to give you practical ways to be able to respond to this. So, Father, we thank you. And, God, for everyone that's responding and everyone that's, that's watching, and, God, you've been moving. You've been moving in their hearts right now. What I ask for, God, is this, for you to speak to them really clear. For some, they need to move towards you. For others, they need to move with you. And for others, they need to move for you. And Father, my prayer for them, wherever you find that you would speak to them right now. God, where there needs to be repentance, a turning away, a saying I'm sorry they would do. For others, Lord God, there are things that need to be cut out of their life they would do. God, for some right now, they are in a really hard season and they want to get out of it. I pray that Holy Spirit, that you would come right now in their lives. You would empower them. You would comfort them. You would give them peace as you would walk with them and they would know, they would literally feel you walking with them in the midst of the rough and tough season that they're in. Father, we love you and we honor you and we thank you that we serve such a big God, but who's also so personal. You are so powerful, but yet so personal. God, thank you. Thank you for being willing to be personal with us, but also being so powerful. And help us to be a people who live and walk this way so that we can help others do that. So we can bring the shalom of God to the world. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to encourage your family simply this, that if you all responded today, again, maybe it's the, it's the idea of man coming to a relationship with Jesus. Hey, I want to encourage you to get part of the Zoom let out at the end today, okay? Become a part of the Zoom let out. Again, uh, again you know, some of y'all, y'all use a different type of let out, right? The club let out. No, go to the Zoom let out, all right? Again, take that next step. Connect with somebody, all right? Here's another big thing for everyone watching. Get signed up for our assist intensive that is coming up. Again, this idea of seasons, we're going to actually break this down in a very personalized way for you to help you discover what season you're in, develop a plan for that season, and then see you deploy that into the world. And it's going to be an incredible time. So I want to encourage you that let this moment be a movement. The moment for movement, either get a part of our Zoom let out or get signed up right now for our SIS Intensive. And at this time, I would like to ask you guys to join us in worship. Now, I know right now, uh, again, this can be a little bit weird and strange. Maybe you're you're there by yourself, which it shouldn't be weird and strange. There's nobody there. You sing in the shower. You sing in your car alone. Again, I know if I was in a car with you, I'd be invited to a concert, right? Like it is for me, okay? You get in my car, it's a straight concert, right? You may be in there with some friends right now. Let me just encourage you, turn the TV as loud as it can, all right? You may be in there with your family right now. And again, parents in this room, it's important. Right now, we're gonna go into a time of worship to actually maybe stand to your feet, to actually engage in this time in worship. Again, let me tell you, you don't have to be in a building. You don't have to be in a building. Some of the most powerful times I've ever had in worship was not in a building. It was actually alone with God. And so let me encourage you right now to stand to your feet, put your phone down, and enter into a time of worshiping our King.
Good morning, Engage Church. My name is Trey Zoda, and I have the pleasure of serving here at Engage Online as the experience architect. So my entire life, I've waffled between one of two extremes. On the first, I thought that if I didn't tithe, 
that God would punish me somehow. And on the second, I thought that if I could force myself to be cheerful, that somehow I'd get back more than I gave. Well, whenever I was scared, I thought that God was just out to punish me. And whenever I thought that I could force myself to be cheerful, I actually was thinking there was some way that I could manipulate God. Second Corinthians 9, 7 says to give with a cheerful heart for God loves a cheerful giver. Well, giving with a cheerful heart isn't a requirement or some standard to meet. It should actually be an indicator to us of what's going on in our heart. If we are giving cheerfully, it's a sign that we feel we're receiving God's love and recognizing that everything that we have comes from him. And we want to acknowledge that by giving back to him. Let's pray. God, thank you for everything that you're doing here at Engage Online. Thank you for the blessings that you just keep pouring out to us. Thank you that you allow us to know you, know your son, and for everything that you've done for us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. What a wonderful message that was. Again, we are so excited to get connected with you guys. Make sure that you fill out a connect card if you've never filled one out before. Mm -hmm. Join a serve team. Mm -hmm. Again, we are recruiting for our Engage <laughs> Online serve team and can be found under the Expressions team or mm -hmm. we're connected with the Expressions team. We would love for you guys to also join the Zoom let out right yes. after service. Again, this is a really cool moment where we get to see you guys' faces, talk, pray, answer any questions that you might have mm -hmm. um, and get to know each other a little bit more. To find the link for all of those things, you could go to engagechallahassee.com forward slash home. And then just to recap a few of the things that I said at the beginning of service, this is your little reminder. If you are new to Rock With Jesus or new to Engage, please get signed up for Catalyst. It's a really good and easy way to build those super strong spiritual foundations so that you're ready for everything that's coming ahead and down the road. Second, our assist intensive is starting next month and it's going to go side by side with our seasons sermon series, that's the tongue twister, um, but you're going to learn all about how to discover what season you're in, develop different characteristic traits that you'll need for each season you find yourself, and as well as deploy different strategies for each season moving forward in the future. So if you haven't yet, we had a ton of people get signed up last Sunday. Make sure that you get signed up today for that. It's going to be really incredible. And then last but not least, the Nehemiah Institute is 43 days away. Woo! And we are so excited for you to be a part of our summer session. This is such an incredible opportunity to really deepen your walk with the Lord. If you're ready to be challenged emotionally and mentally and spiritually and then do it all in community, you don't want to miss this. So for all of those things and to get signed up, you can head to engagehelhassie.com forward slash home. Yeah, and just a reminder, Engage Online, we have 20 spots reserved just for you guys, <laughs> but spots are filling up pretty quickly, so make sure that you get signed up as soon as possible. Yeah. Um, we are about to head off of here mm -hmm. and right onto our Zoom let out. Can't wait to see you guys there, but if not, which would be really sad. Yes. <laughs> We'll see you next Sunday at our usual service times, 9 a.m. or 11 a.m. Mm -hmm. Until next time, we will see you then. We all we got.